Hey everyone, welcome back to Women in Science Books, and today we're going to be looking at animal behavior. Uh, the different uh, scientists who have looked at uh, different aspects of animal, be animal behavior and animal language uh, over the last century or so. Uh, and what I'm going to start with is an interesting memoir, uh, which you might not think of as an animal behavior book, but I kind of do. Um, it's called My Life in a Man-Made Jungle by Belle Benchley. Uh, this is from 1942 that this was written. Uh, and it's her account of sort of taking the San Diego Zoo, which was just a bunch of animals that people had bought and didn't know what to do with, uh, and changing it into uh, the world's sort of first animals first zoo. Uh, and why I put it kind of in, in the category of animal behavior is that she was really interested in, well, what sorts of things make animals nervous? Uh, what make them unhappy? How can we observe them and use observations of those animals to then help build enclosures that aren't as stressful uh, for those animals? And as a result, the San Diego Zoo kind of uh, led the world in, um, you know, not only the treatment of the animals there, but um, in developing new methods of, uh, you know, having on-site uh, physicians to attend to them, um, and then, uh, you know, having enclosures where the animals could just leave if they were feeling stressed out. They could just go out into the back, and if it, you know, means that some, some parents don't get to show their kids the otters that day, well, then they don't get to see the otters that day. It's better for the animals. And uh, lifespans at the San Diego Zoo were, you know, 10, 20 times what they were uh, for animals at other parks. And then her methods just caught on fire. So a really interesting book about that early attempt. So check it out. Then we have to move to uh, the people who are actually doing animal behavior studies out in the field uh, rather than sort of in these enclosures like Benchley did. Uh, and you kind of have to give pride of place to Anne Innes Dagg, uh, who is enjoying something of a renaissance right now. Um, this book, her memoir, Smitten by Giraffe, uh, is, is a charming and frustrating book at the same time. Because, um, you know, it describes her going out and, uh, you know, before Goodall, before, you know, Fossey, before all those guys. Um, you know, she just went out into Africa and said, I'm going to study giraffe behavior and found a way to make it happen, uh, and produced, you know, some of these first studies of these animals' behavior in the wild, uh, which was quite cool, and then came back to the United States and said, I have all this interesting data, all these interesting videos, and she could not get a full-time appointment, uh, for the life of her, could not get tenure, in spite of how revolutionary her work was. So this is kind of both about... Uh, the work she did, that early, early work uh, in observing giraffe in the wild and having to come up with observation techniques from thin air, um, and then the, the sort of academic tribulations of later. Uh, and then she was sort of forgotten for a few decades until very recently people have decided, hey, you know, this is a neat person. Uh, and there's been a documentary about her, um, and then this, this memoir, which is really quite cool. So yeah, check that one out. Which moves us to uh, the trimates, uh, who I'm going to expand uh, to include uh, one more key figure in primate studies in sort of the mid-20th century. Um, but yeah, the trimates was the term given to three particular uh, primatologists in the mid-20th century, uh, all of whom stem in one way or another from the uh, influence uh, and, and sponsorship of Richard Leakey. Um, and the first one, you don't really need to say anything about Jane Goodall. Um, th you can't say too much about Jane Goodall, her importance uh, in the study of animal behavior, her work going out into the field, figuring out how am I going to study chimpanzees. It was famously difficult to study them out in the wild. Uh, and not only figure out a way to do it, but then observed all of these new behaviors, um, you know, observing them with their tool use, observing meat eating among these guys. Um, and then, you know, a, a life of conservation work after that. And uh, she's written many books. If you want to kind of take in the full scope and significance of her, and you have some time, uh, Dale Peterson's book on Jane Goodall is really great, a wonderful account of her, her youth, uh, and then just putting her in the context of 
uh, other primate studies and why she was so revolutionary. Um, so that one is is a wonderful. It looks like it would be you know weeks and weeks to get through it, but it's so fascinating you just tear through it. So it's really cool. Um, then of course, uh, more tragically, is the story of Diane Fossey um, and her work with gorillas um, in Africa, which ended in her murder. Um, which was uh, a, a tragic story of her trying to fight the hunters uh, in Africa who were trying to sell, you know, gorilla mementos and gor sell gorillas to zoos and all this sort of stuff, and who didn't, you know, who just slaughtered their way through the native population. And her attempts to, uh, you know, get the local government to do something about it in spite of massive corruption there, uh, and that ending up costing her her life. Um, there's her, her book, Gorillas in the Mist, of course, you should, you know, check that out. But if you want to then continue the story up through the end and those sort of tragic end days, uh, Farley Mowat's Woman in the Mists uh, is a, a good account of that uh, and about, you know, just how difficult her end period was there and, and what it was like as um, others saw the success of her work and then tried to claim it from her and rip it from her hands. Um, it's a really tragic, uh, story that, that happens a lot. Uh, so yeah, um, definitely, um, a good source for that sort of end period to supplement your, your gorilla in the mists. Um, then, uh, the third of them, uh, was Galdikas, Baruta Galdikas, uh, her reflections of Eden. So she was working with orangutans. So we have chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans. Uh, and, you know, these were sort of, until her time, considered the sort of slowest, least interesting of the primates. They're, they're like, they're big, they're not, they're not as socially interesting, um, but she sort of revealed how deep of a spatial memory they have and how interesting their relationships with each other really are you know, in spite of being isolated, that there's actually, you know, they, they tend to live more isolated sort of lives, but um, certainly than chimpanzees, um, but that there is still a lot of detail there, but especially they're just off the charts, uh, you know, sort of spatial temporal memory, so that they know every tree in the forest, when they need to check it, when they don't, uh, when the food in it is good, when it's not going to be, for, you know, dozens of different tree types spread across a vast uh, quantity of land uh, to discover that they are much more interesting than they had been given credit for. Um, then the one who doesn't uh, come from Leakey, uh, but who, you know, sort of fills in the primate spectrum, um, is you get uh, baboons and Gene Altman, uh, is the person who figured out how to do baboons. And she generally figured out how do you really, really do field studies of animals. Uh, and so this is her uh, book, Baboon Mothers and Infants, um, which is a, you know, a study of how do you do field research with behavior. And what she's trying to correct is the tendency of, of natural field workers to... Um, just record things that are interesting. So you only record the animal who's doing something interesting and you're ignoring the behavior of everybody else. Instead, you have to be more scientific about it. You have to figure out a way of sampling everybody at all times and resisting that impulse to, uh, you know, go to the, the baboon clown of the class and constantly talk about what they're doing. Uh, and so that really raised the bar on how to statistically do animal behavior. So yeah, she's, uh, this book is, is probably more technical than, than most folks would be into, but if you're really interested in how is animal behavior done, how do you make sure that your data is representative, uh, she is the reigning monarch of that. So now we move to the area of, uh, animal language, uh, and to what degree animals have language, what degree they have intelligence like ours, uh, and whether using ourselves as the yardstick is even a meaningful or useful thing to do um, when talking about intelligence. Um, and of course, the early studies on these uh, are primarily in the primates uh, and then in dolphins. And uh, I'd like to point to a few guys whose books are, are really critical. Um, 
So the gardeners were the ones who kind of started this process off. Uh, and um, they have a book, so this is uh, Beatrix Gardner is the one we're interested in, um, about teaching sign language to chimpanzees, right? They started this whole thing about like, well, can we converse? Can we find uh, a way to communicate uh, with these animals and thereby kind of plumb the depths of their understanding of their world and their capacity for linguistic representation of their world? Uh, and their early efforts, uh, you know, this was, this one was published in, well, it's published in 89, but uh, I documents work done decades before that, um, in, uh, 19, or uh, mid sixties, uh, started us down this whole road of, we can perhaps use sign language as a bridge between the two species. Um, these guys don't have the vocal structure necessary to form words as we do, but can they still understand? And they were the innovators uh, in doing that. And Beatrix Gardner uh, was a significant figure in that. Um, and then you move to, so that was her work with chimpanzees, and we kind of uh, test, you know, different uh, species to see how they do things. Uh, so uh, Francine Patterson, uh, The Education of Coco, uh, she was maybe the most famous uh, case of this, and she came along, um, and, you know, she's basically, this is the 1970s now, that she's doing her work, and this is with the gorilla Coco, uh, who passed somewhat recently, very sad, um, and just the very broad vocabulary uh, that she was able to um, teach Coco, and then the concepts that she was able to uh, explore using that, and this is her account of doing that, The Education of Coco. Um, this is one of the very first books I remember reading in All of Women in Science, and I was just captivated by it. Uh, this was, uh, Mine was from the library. This is a copy I picked up later, uh, which, if you'll see, has Coco's signature in it. Um, it's got a thumbprint from Coco, uh, the gorilla. Um, so that's, that's quite sweet. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, and, um, you know, it talks about the same time, this fight that was happening, uh, sort of in the late seventies about whether what these animals can do is language. Uh, and so linguists kept moving the goalposts back every time that a gardener or a Patterson or a Savage Rumba, uh, every time one of them would discover something about what these animals could do, the linguist would then say, oh, well, that doesn't really count as language. You need this to have language. And every time that uh, they would show that, oh, well, they have that too, they would say, well, that's not really what we meant. It's this that really counts as language. And they keep moving the goalpost back every time that, that uh, they discover that primates have some sense of this and then this and then this. Um, so it's, it's a frustrating story because you keep seeing them you know, working so hard to establish these different characteristics of their understanding of the world, saying, okay, we've got it now, we've we met your criteria, here you go, and then the linguist is like, no, that, that was our old criteria, we have new criteria now, which is um, very interesting. Um, so that's gorillas. Uh, Kanzi, uh, so this is uh, instead of with, um, you know, normal chimps, uh, and, and gorillas, these are the bonobos, um, and, uh, you know, taking it a, fr a step further, so this is, uh, a little bit later, still, I think, uh, early 80s, um, and not only sort of linguistic studies, but sort of conceptual studies, uh, and these guys, uh, their work with keyboards and being able to, uh, you know, communicate between each other to accomplish complex tasks so that, you know, one of them needs to say, all right, uh, for me to get this banana, you've got to go into that room and get this thing and bring it back and then I'll do this. And then if I do this, then I'll communicate to you that this needs to happen. And like using symbols to communicate complex tasks between each other uh, is uh, what Sue Savage Rumba did. Uh, and this is sort of an account of her work and her struggles with getting it recognized. Uh, and then you get the other side of the picture, which is the dolphins. Uh, 
And The Dolphin in the Mirror is the book written by the person who did a lot of the mirror studies with dolphins about self-recognition, uh, and this Diana Rice. Um, and not only that, but, you know, studies about the play of dolphins and do they just play for the sake of it, um, right? Do they have this sort of sense of creative, spontaneous play? Do they have a sense of spontaneously being able to put together words, uh, linguistic clicks? So she studied the clicks of them and studied their ability to take two different clicks and combine them together to make a, a merged click that represents a new merged concept. And all this really, really cool stuff that dolphins can intellectually do. Uh, and she did the studies on a lot of that stuff. And this is her account of that and her difficulties in getting the linguistic community to recognize any of it. Uh, so yeah, but between all this stuff, um, it makes you feel, uh, you know, either that you, you have a lot more cousins out there intellectually, uh, which is a, a really neat thing to, to realize and how phenomenal um, different intelligences can be and what they can do. So yeah, definitely look at them. So I want to talk uh, about a few sort of people in very vastly different areas um, that don't group together quite as nicely as, you know, the trimates and the linguists and all that kind of stuff. Um, Katie Payne, uh, who uh, did work on um, whale song and trying to interpret and, and, and decode whale song uh, together with her husband, Robert or Roger Payne. I always get it. I never get it right. Um, but it's one of those two. Uh, so then she has a book on her work with elephants, uh, Silent Thunder, and figuring out how they communicate <clears throat> and how that then, you know, her work with that then translated also to sort of working for conservation of these animals. Because when you're out there and you're kind of seeing how rapidly they're being depleted in the course of doing your studies, you kind of can't help the game involved like Diane Fossey did. Um, it did not end as tragically for uh, Katie Payne. Um, but this is, yeah, her, her accounts of her field work with elephants uh, and in using her, um, you know, sort of communications insights to figure out stuff about um, how they use sort of uh, low frequency, you know, frequencies that we can't hear, low frequencies to communicate over vast distances um, is, is really interesting. Um, less on the behavior side, but because we're on elephants, sure. Uh, is Dame Daphne Sheldrick's book, um, Love, Life, and Elephants. Uh, it's about uh, her work to create elephant sanctuaries uh, in, in Africa and to kind of um, uh, figure out uh, how to work with local governments and with local resources in order to try and stem the titanic flow of, of poaching uh, that was happening in the time. Uh, and this sort of tells that story of Kenya uh, and her experiences in that Kenya uh, that went through, you know, it was revolutionary times uh, and then trying to establish this, this preserve for animals. Uh, so it's less about animal behavior, more about uh, conservation, but of course she makes many interesting um, observations about behavior and particularly the behavior of uh, orphaned elephants and how the act of being orphaned sort of... Um, alters them uh, that are interesting. Uh, I can't I, I, I can't help but put Evelyn Cheeseman in here. I'll talk about Evelyn Cheeseman anytime you give me the chance to because uh, uh, you know first of all insect studies I'm there for uh, anytime uh, and just these this her, her sort of classic take on um, communicating the life of insects to a broad audience. Um, is really neat, and she had a very interesting life as well. Uh, what I've got here is Insects, Their Secret World is one of the ones that you can find a little bit more readily. Um, and yeah, uh, just just her attempts to right talk about insects and, and their behavior and their life. Uh, you know, I can see them really influencing, having had a lot of uh, influences to people today who are studying just these really cool behaviors that you see. So like the Madeleine Girards who are studying, you know, peacock spider and how their vibration wiggle dances work, um, you know, and to, to the bee studies of bee communication, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I see kind of you know, having a lot of its seeds in the work that she did. Um, 
more than half a century ago. And you can't leave out, uh, when you're doing animal behavior and animal intelligence, you got to talk about the octopus. Um, and uh, Jennifer uh, Mather, or Mather, I never cleared it up when I was talking to her, um, probably should have asked, uh, but uh, her book on, um, on the octopus is, presents a lot of her work in determining, well, what, how far does the intelligence of the octopus go? Uh, from its foraging strategies uh, to its, you know, if they, you know, they'll have studies where they have like nice octopus caretaker, mean octopus caretaker. And like, does the octopus react differently to the two of them? Like, can it recognize like, that's the jerk. Uh, I'm going to react differently to jerk caretaker than to nice caretaker. And that they do, and their ability to problem solve, and like, what are the limits of their abilities to problem solve? And it's really fascinating. And just just octopuses, uh, which she makes a, you know, this is one of the many things I learned from this book is that it's not octopi, like I'd said all my life. It's octopuses. Uh, that octopuses um, have just every aspect of them is cool. There's nothing not cool about the octopus. <laughs> Everything is awesome, uh, and it's all in here. Uh, and her her studies are in here. Uh, the studies she did with various partners are in here, and it's just a neat book. Uh, so yeah, Octopus, uh, the Ocean's Intelligent Invertebrate, uh, is, you know, just everybody. There's nobody who's not going to read this and think, you know, uh, whatever, octopuses, they suck. No, octopuses are awesome, and you should read this book. Um, so uh, that's a bunch of stuff about, uh, you know, women's research in animal behavior, some neat books. Uh, I believe next time I've got a, a special plan to celebrate. Um, here, can you hand me that book that's under that other book <laughs> that's what? under the stack of notepads? This is the only way to refer to things that are in this room is what, uh, what stack they're in. Um, eh. There you go. Um, I'm glad how that's, that's how you communicate to Yes. Uh, Janine Atkins uh, just came out with a new book. Um, we talked a uh, bit before about her book um, about sort of astronomers. Uh, this is a book about uh, mathematicians uh, in her, her own, you know, very unique style. Uh, so I wanted, next time I'm going to talk about um, books for the young adult and, and children's audience about women in science, some of my favorites, as sort of a celebration of this book coming out, because it's, I've been reading it and it's really cool. So that's going to be next time. Until then, keep on reading, uh, and we'll see you later. Bye, everyone. Bye.